welcome everyone to uh, tonight's volunteer forum. Uh, joining you from Bangholm, and the uh, the topic tonight is training. So, uh, looking forward to a uh, uh, extremely exciting night. A lot of things to talk about, uh, and uh, look forward to the questions coming through from the audience. Uh, before I start, I would like to welcome and acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, and pay my respects to elders, past and present, and welcome any Indigenous people who join us tonight. Uh, so as I said, you're joining us from Bangholm. Uh, we've come down to the, uh, the training college to, um, to have a look at what's going on tonight. Uh, we've got a little bit of activity happening out on the pad uh, and we've got a big panel here tonight to uh, talk about all things, all things training. So if you could let us know where you're calling from, uh, there's probably the big key uh, thing tonight that people might be already questioning. Uh, and I know there's already been some uh, discussion in the chat. So. The question is, where's the chief? And uh, I think the only way that we can resolve that is uh, pass to the chief. Good evening, Jason. Good afternoon or good evening, Rowan. Uh, now, what's going on? How did this happen? How come I'm in this seat? Well, uh, well thanks, Rowan. Uh, from my home to yours tonight, uh, you know, for near on three years, I I've managed to avoid a little thing called COVID, but alas, I uh, could not avoid it anymore. So unfortunately, uh, I, uh, I have COVID, uh, and that is why I am uh, I am home at the moment. Bit of it going around at the moment. Uh, it is quite topical, and it is a bit of a, rem a reminder uh, to all of our people to ensure that we are taking those universal precautions. I mean, obviously, I didn't, um, and to make sure that we are trying to keep ourselves uh, safe. So um, I wanted to. Uh, yeah, obviously, uh, thank you, Rowan, uh, for stepping into uh, the fold. It is the absolute 11th hour, uh, and I mean the 11th hour, uh, to ensure that the volunteer forum must go on. So, uh, and given that it is a training theme, uh, how appropriate that uh, that you should end up in the uh, in the main chair this evening. A couple of things I did want to touch on uh, before I do hand you back to to Rowan for the rest of this evening's uh, activities. Um, a big development uh, for uh, for our members. Uh, if you're anything like me, I'm sure you, you know, for the, all the kilometres that I travel at Victoria, uh, visiting our brigades, uh, calling in and seeing people, uh, what better thing to do than to listen to something active in the car? And now you can listen to the volunteer forum that is available on the Apple podcast, the Google podcast and Spotify. So, uh, and also on Podbean. So if you are looking for something on those long car trips, uh, coming over Christmas, those family vacations, uh, do it lampoon style uh, and listen to the, uh, to the volunteer forum. Uh, just look up CFA volunteer forum. The podcast will be there uh, and they'll be available uh, after every volunteer forum. So uh, you'll be able to listen to them as well as, uh, as well as watch. Uh, replays here on YouTube, but of course, uh, you yeah, know, live is always better. And on a more serious note, uh, and again, my congratulations to the comms team for making that happen because I think it's a pearler idea, uh, and, and my thanks to them. Uh, lastly, I just wanted this evening to say a big thank you. Uh, thank you to all uh, staff and all the volunteers who have made uh, it possible for us to deploy. Uh, interstate and tonight we're going to hear from two exceptional volunteers uh, who are currently in the Northern Territory uh, doing some fantastic work and I'll let them talk about what they're up to uh, but for all the strike teams and the drivers uh, that are now making their way up to Queensland and for all the other strike teams that will be jumping onto planes tomorrow and the following days uh, I just wanted to say thank you for taking the time out uh, away from your families uh, away from your workplaces uh, to help out across the country. Uh, we always said this season was going to be a return to the traditional Australian summer. Uh, it hasn't disappointed. Uh, we are watching the situation quite closely across the country uh, and myself uh, are on regular hookups with other commissioners and chiefs from across the country, uh, keeping an eye on what the future resource requests are. I do anticipate uh, an ongoing resource request, uh, particularly into Queensland and New South Wales, uh, given the sheer size, volume and number of fires that are affecting uh, those two states. Uh, and that's not likely to change until we see some significant rainfall uh, in, across, uh, across those areas. Uh, in particular, for some parts of New South Wales have now returned uh, to drought affected areas. Uh, it means that we're also keeping a close eye back here at home. So uh, whilst we are sending resources away uh, to assist 
uh, our, our, camp, our sister agencies uh, across the country. We are keeping a very close eye on conditions here at home uh, and also making sure that we've got enough capability and capacity uh, to, to look after our own Victorian community. So thank you very much uh, to all involved uh, from myself, uh, the board, Natalie McDonald, uh, and all the executive of CFA. We're greatly appreciative for all your efforts uh, and please Godspeed and good luck. So. Without further ado, I'm going to hand back to, to Rowan, uh, who will take you through the rest of tonight's show. Uh, please don't disappoint. Ask him every hard <laughs> question that you've always been scared to ask me. I'm sure he knows the answer in spades. If not, I might jump in the track and ch chat and have a go myself. Um, but certainly, Rowan, thank you very much. My, I'm very appreciative of, uh, of you stepping in at the 11th hour. And with that, I'll uh, hand back over to you. Thank you. No worries. Thanks. Chief, and uh, we certainly hope that you recover quickly and uh, are able to get back out and around because I know um, you certainly have a fair bit on your plate and uh, doing it from home is not always easy. So um, look forward to your return. And I think the um, ability to listen to podcasts while we're all travelling is going to be a real bonus for the organisation as well. Um, and you're right, Jason has given me very clear instructions about making sure that uh, we ask the hard questions. So uh, to the panel... Um, Let's uh, see if we can get the right answers here. So um, again, thanks Jason and we look forward to, uh, to catching up. So on the panel tonight, uh, we, uh, we first start off, we've got Aaron Gardner from Bang Home and Pad Supervisors. So welcome, Aaron. Thank you. Uh, I've got Nicole Levi, Manager uh, Training Development, sorry, Design and Development uh, from my team, from ODT. Um, Molly Brands, Program Designer. Uh, Molly's well known to our uh, uh, GFF review and uh, to a number of brigades and Molly's certainly been out on the road chatting to people and uh, look forward to having the chat with Molly tonight. And ACFO Stuart Walker, welcome Stuart. Uh, Stuart stepped into our team for the time being um, and he's uh, ACFO Learning and Development so good to have you on board Stu as well. Um, if, uh, if people have got questions please put them through the chat through, through uh, the YouTube live. Um, we'll try and answer questions throughout the session. Uh, we've had a couple questions come through. If we're unable to answer questions by the end, we will give you a link to the, uh, the training uh, email address, which I'll do it now, is, uh, is training at cfa.vic.gov.au. Um, if you're unable to get your question through or if it's more detailed, uh, link us through there and we'll, um, we'll have a chat with you as we go. Um, Firstly, we'll, uh, we'll just talk quickly about the interstate deployment. So Jason's given a, uh, a pretty good overview of uh, where we're at with the interstate deployment. So there's um, essentially we've got crews in three states at the moment. So we've got crews in uh, Northern Territory and we'll talk to them later tonight. So Northern Territory's had fires running uh, for a number of months. All three, um, so all three fire danger areas uh, in Northern Territory are under restrictions at once. Um, I'll come to Queensland, thanks, because I'll jump out of order here, and I'll, so I'll come to Queensland first. Um, Queensland's actually got fires all the way up the coast. There's two major areas where there's fires, which is uh, Toowoomba, where the majority of our crews are going, and now Rockhampton. So um, this is where uh, the majority of uh, CFA and other agency resources are headed as we speak. Um, this week, there'll be over 211 resources uh, into Queensland out of Victoria. So it's a huge effort. Um, the majority of those will be CFA strike teams. Um, of the strike teams that are going through, strike teams will go into Toowoomba uh, and the other two will go all the way up to Rockhampton. So um, huge effort. We've had trucks on the road. As we speak, we've got trucks on the road um, on the way to Toowoomba uh, and then on to Rockhampton. Um, and we've had some crews fly back today that took the first strike team of trucks up. So uh, this has been a pretty big effort so far. You'll see on the screen just the breakdown of it. Uh, strike teams, we're running in a 131 rotation and uh, IMTs, which are multi-agency IMTs, which include both staff and volunteers, um, run a 151 rotation. So um, a little bit longer stay, but uh, 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 certainly we need that longer period for our incident management teams to establish themselves. We've got some aviation support also in place, uh, liaison officers uh, and also DMOs and uh, comms technicians. So um, as you'd expect, a pretty big effort. Uh, the plan is at this stage, we're planning for uh, seven rotations of uh, one strike team and at this stage three, 
rotations of the other ones uh, and looking at at least four rotations of uh, a number of the IMTs. So um, significant effort all the way through to the 22nd of November in our planning at this stage. Pretty fluid. We know things will change and uh, we expect that um, there could be further requests. We'd ask people to make sure through their chain of command that their availability uh, you know, is identified, particularly for IMT people. So to use the IMT availability tool um, or to have that conversation through the chain of command. I will talk about Northern Territory. North, so Northern Territory's had fires running uh, for a long period of time. You can see the, uh, the watch and act uh, in the middle of the screen. Um, uh, that's a significant area and we had fire, we had, Northern Territory had fires running, uh, ran on 40 kilometres overnight uh, late last week. So uh, they're in a fair bit of, uh, fair bit of pain. Uh, for Northern Territory, they've had uh, a decreased ability to deliver training to their volunteers and to their park rangers. They've made a request through CFA for us to send instructors. So we've got two volunteer instructors up there working at the moment, uh, working extremely hard, and we'll talk to them later on tonight. And the last one's uh, the New South Wales uh, scenario. So again, significant fires in New South Wales, and Jason spoke to them uh, before, I think. They're around the 80 mark at this stage. Uh, we've got one air attack supervisor into New South Wales, um, which uh, isn't a huge commitment, uh, but we know New South Wales are keeping their resources local, uh, hence why we've gone all the way to Queensland. Um, we could expect to see more resources requested into New South Wales as time goes on. So that's just a bit of a snapshot uh, in the deployments. We've got uh, a, a number of flights flying out tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, I think the first flights are you know, 7 o'clock around that time and, and through to lunchtime. Uh, so huge commitment and again thank you to everyone who's um, put their hand up to go. But I also want to thank the people who have put their hand up to stay and look after our communities as well. So um, really important for that. Uh, what we might do now is just jump to have a quick look at the promo for tonight's show. Okay, welcome back. So uh, a fair bit on tonight around that training space. So uh, I know we've been really keen to run this session for a long time and I know uh, the comms team have been really keen to set this up. So um, here's our chance to really get into training and we might kick off Aaron uh, and welcome. Um, just have a bit of a chat about the um, Bang Home facility. Um, do you want to give us a bit of a rundown yeah, of your thanks, facility? Um, Jeff, this so it's been really, really busy over the last couple of months. We're probably back to pre-COVID levels, which is really good. So we've got um, a lot of uh, different activities happening, mainly around that Respond to Urban Fire. We've got about five of those courses running. Um, we've probably completed about four of those. We've got one for District 8 and one for District 13 running at the moment. Also doing a lot of uh, work around skills maintenance for brigades, and that's really increased, so, so that's sort of taking up a lot of our time. Still a lot more um, we can get through. Um, so yeah, if you need to book a training course, certainly get onto the district or get onto the website and book one. Yeah, thanks Aaron. So um, really pleasing to see that the training facility is being used. And I, you know, I know across the board, uh, you know, our team give us the data on how the, uh, how the training facilities are going. And at this stage, compared to last year across, for this month, we're 500 more students this month than last year this time last year. So, you know, that's, uh, that's really busy. And I know tonight we've got um, Pakenamuppa and Cockatoo Brigade out there doing skills maintenance on the pad and we hope to do a bit of a cross, uh, just have a look at what they're up to. Um, and we've got a low voltage fuse removal course in as well. So, um, you know, I, I imagine, uh, Aaron, it's not rare to have multiple courses here running together. How do you manage that? So we've got uh, quite a bit of 
uh, we've got a broad site, so there's 44 acres of, of site that we've got to, to utilise. We've got about 20 different drill areas, so we can certainly spread um, brigades and groups out when we're out there. Um, and we've also got a lot of facilities, so uh, thank you for the new BA sets that we've got. I think we've got another eight BA sets, so uh, on the weekend we actually had 18 people in BA at the one time. So, yeah, that's the sort of thing that we're doing to, to assist with getting more volunteers through training. Yeah, excellent. So we did roll out additional sets uh, in line with the Respond to Urban because we knew that demand. So oh, I'm really pleased to hear that, uh, that that's been a real success. So yeah. um, that's really good, Aaron. Um, what's new here? What, what have you been working on? What's in development? So we've got a, um, a new building being, being built and hopefully that'll be finished and signed off shortly. So there's a new gas-fired fire attack building. Um, that'll enhance again our Respond to Urban fire uh, capability. Um, so that, that building we're hoping that we can get up to about 150 degrees, to do, so pretty realistic firefighting in that. Um, and um, there's about, there's three rooms of fire we can operate at, at, in that building, so we can have a, a lounge room fire, a bedroom fire or a kitchen fire and, and really work on and hone those skills for respond to urban fire. Yeah, awesome. I, don't, I think uh, my understanding, when I've had a look at the prop that's being set up, you can actually monitor and watch the crew's inside? Yeah, so we've got thermal imaging cameras set up in the building. We can actually record that and then play it back to the participants as well so they can see how they've gone with their firefight through thermal imaging. Yeah, great. Um, that's, that's really good. That's, uh, that's going to make life a little bit easier, I think, in, in some of that, yeah. uh, you know, keeping the, the pad operating safely, which is always a requirement, um, but just keeping an eye on where people are doing their search patterns and similar is brilliant. So I think uh, we're probably going to uh, jump to a video now. So um, uh, sit back and enjoy and let's have a bit of a look at the Bangholm campus. Training Centre Bangholm. The Bangholm site is approximately 44 acres with over 20 practical training areas and a variety of classrooms to meet your brigade and group training needs. While our primary focus is on training CFA volunteers, we also provide training support to other emergency services and government agencies. Let's go and explore some of the facilities and meet the team. This is our BA training and maintenance area. The campus operate both electronic and classic BA sets. Uh, we have uh, enough sets to be able to run multiple courses at the one time, along with uh, multiple uh, BA cylinders as well. We also have a lot of ancillary equipment, such as BA control boards, uh, portable radios to be able to support courses as well. Uh, in our other room, we have uh, thermal imaging cameras, splash suits and gas suits to be able to support uh, thermal imaging courses and hazmat courses, as well as respond to urban and uh, other structural courses around the site. This is our breathing apparatus and search and rescue training facility. It's a repurposed uh, building from the original infrastructure on site. Uh, it has three levels. The top level is set up for um, an open office plan type environment, which is set up for uh, BA operators that have just uh, undertaken their qualification. The middle level is set up like a house, so it has bedrooms, bathrooms and dining rooms, and that's set up for uh, uh, more experienced operators. And then the bottom level is set up uh, with uneven floors, doors that can move and, and walls that can move and close, and uh, trip hazards to give our experienced operators uh, more of a challenge. Here at Bangholm we have four hot fire training areas, that being the gas pad, gas ruptures, flammable liquids and the fire tech building. So here on the gas pad is the tank of fire which is uh, fire the valves and it run down the drain. The next is the overhead tank fire which fire at the valve at the tank and at the ground level. Then the gantry which is fire at the valves at the top and at the ground level. Then over further, going into a domestic setting, which is a house fired on the ground, the cylinders, the eaves and an internal fire. And then lastly here is a car fire, which will fire inside the cabin and under the bonnet. So here we have the fire attack building. It's basically a two-storey concrete building set up as a two-bedroom apartment, uh, mainly used for BA search and rescue, but it also been used for the structural firefighter course now as the CFA rolls that course out. So this area can also be used for low structure with drills like cars, bin fires, shed fires, etc. 
So this area here is our flammable liquids pad. One side's the extinguisher tray in it area, which has uh, trays out there, which we pour flammable liquids in. And this side is set up as a service station. We've got the three cars and a gas cylinder to simulate a, a local service station. So our fourth area, a uh, fire area on site, is the uh, gas ruptures area. We have a medium, low and high pressure gas mains, which we can ignite. We also use uh, mobile props, such as the sheds, the cars and uh, gas cylinders, which you can put around this area as well. The Vimtech Bang Home Campus has uh, got a large multi-purpose area here, which gets used regularly for driver training and is also an approved helicopter landing site enabling us to land rotary aircraft uh, throughout the year for aviation related training courses. The campus here is also home to the project team for the Fire Aviation Flight Simulator project uh, which is developing computer based simulation capability uh, for the sector uh, and it's due for completion in mid 2024. At the Bang Home campus we have a lot of classroom based uh, facilities inside. Let's go have a look. So at Bang Home, we have six classrooms available for theory sessions, similar to this one here. There is data docking stations available. Each room has either a data projector or a 75 inch TV screen. We have whiteboards available. Anything that you could possibly need for your theory sessions. So this classroom is our outdoor classroom. It's also classed as our wet classroom. This is where members can come on site, still in their turnout gear, have their theory presentation, and then continue out with their practical training. Now if you come on through here, I'll show you the change rooms. The lockers around the outside of the room are available for any of the students when they attend the site. Down the back of the change rooms there are shower facilities, so at the end of the day they can actually shower on site. Now I'll take you on through to the dining room. So for members that come here for a prolonged period of time, morning tea and lunch are also available. For anyone that does have dietary requirements, please make sure you let the admin team know and they'll make sure you're fully catered for. We have external caterers that come in on site and this is where you would be eating. Thanks for joining myself and the team. Remember, the campus is open seven days a week to support training at times that suits you. If you would like further information or to book a training activity, all information can be found on the CFA intranet. We hope to see you soon. That's fantastic, Aaron. It's, uh, that's a real showcase of our training college uh, one of eight and uh, uh, really pleasing to see that. And I know we've got a number of uh, um, updates on uh, members online with the uh, training campuses. Before we come back to you, I just, uh, Nicole, we've got a couple of questions around the RPL process. Uh, so uh, Aaron's asked a question about the process being out of date uh, and Steve's talked about whether prepare, test and maintain as an RPL is available. Are you able to answer those? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Amanda Norris, our manager for quality and evaluation, her, um, she and I are working together to revamp the RPL process to put together a streamlined package of documents that are easier for people to follow uh, and will make access to RPL, uh, well, up, updated. Uh, prepare, test and maintain is our first project uh, off, off the top for that uh, because we're aware that there are a large number of people who are still waiting to get through that program. So part of what we're doing with that one is we're adding some online, uh, on, online options so people can work through the knowledge questions themselves and then complete some, some tasks within their brigade and submit those so that they can be uh, assessed without having to wait for, for a lengthy nomination process. Uh, thanks, Nicole. So there's uh, certainly a lot happening in that space. And I know uh, RPL or RCC is a, is a real key to be able to pick up and, and manage some of those things that people have been doing for a while, but we're playing a bit of catch up. So um, thank you for that. Um, Aaron, just in regards to the training campuses, how do you book, you know, how does a brigade get online? You know you've got a lot of brigades here. Um, how do they go about it? So the, uh, the booking process is through uh, Brigades Online and that's currently being updated. So if people have a look at the uh, new Brigades Online uh, webpage for campuses, they'll be able to select the campus they want to book and the booking forms are in that. Excellent. So um, thank you. So I'd, I'd encourage people to go to Brigades Online. If you're still struggling to work your way through it, uh, I'd encourage you to talk back through your 
CLD within the district uh, would uh, have a conversation around the pathways to, to actually um, do those, uh, those registrations or expressions of interest for training. So um, thanks, Aaron. Look, I also want to thank you for hosting us tonight. Um, you know, your busy schedule and it's, it's another thing, but it's really good to be able to come along and, um, and have a look at what's going on and, and be a part of it. So it's great to have you. do appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I might just uh, move on to our, our ultra heavy tanker training package. And I think if people recall back to, I think it was the July um, uh, volunteer forum where we rolled out the ultra heavy tanker up at, um, at District 18. Uh, there was a few comments in the chat and, and a bit of a discussion about rail, rolling out the training for the ultra heavy. So um, it's a real uh, pleasure for us to be able to confirm that that training is available. Uh, both uh, an induction package online, but also um, we've worked with uh, the Berry Woolwick Brigade, which has received truck number one, uh, and they're, um, they're up and running. So, um, Stuart, do you just want to walk us through, firstly, um, what the package entails, the induction package? Sure. Thanks, Rowan. So, yeah, very pleased to announce that we've completed the induction package on the Ultra Heavy Tanker. It's a Pretty nice piece of equipment, I've got to say, the Ultra Heavy. Uh, you're talking about a 23 tonne vehicle, 10,000 litres of water, and I think it'll be a great um, thing to have out in the field this summer. So the um, training team has developed uh, nine videos as part of an induction package for this, uh, for this new vehicle. Um, I've really got to acknowledge Nicole's team for making this possible, and Tom Capel, um, who led the development of the videos and Cole Chapman, one of our instructors, who really was spearheading a lot of the uh, detail that went into them, and his counterpart, um, Peter Osborne. But we really, um, we brought together a whole lot of people from CFA, the engineering department, the district mechanical officers, uh, and various other people to deliver it. So this training um, involves, or this induction pro package, has nine videos associated with it. It's about 90 minutes of video, and it's going to cover things like and I'll just read off my screen the, um, the appliance introduction, crew safety systems, and that includes things like the, what sort of burnover protection we've got on our, on our trucks, all the stowed equipment, and some of it will be slightly different to what you've seen before. Uh, the vehicle inspection, so that's going to cover things like all your pre-drive um, uh, drills uh, and also how to use the pump. Uh, we'll be covering off the cabin drill in these videos, any pre-drive drills, how to drive the vehicle. Again, it's 23 tonnes. This is a big vehicle. It doesn't get up and go as quickly as others and it certainly doesn't stop as well as others do. And as well as that, we've covered off what's called the air CTI, which is the central tyre inflation system, which is something different than people would have seen before. So look, in total, these videos go for around an hour and a half. Uh, you can really watch them in any order. And the good thing is you can come back and refer to them at any time. So the equivalent sort of word count in these things is about, as it says, is about um, nearly 14,000 words would be. Um, and if we were to produce that as a text, it would be about 27 pages of text, and that is without photos. In addition to the videos uh, for our induction, we've got a number of other documentation that goes along with us. So not only do you have the videos to watch online, but you've also got um, a number of documentation uh, pieces that go with us. So that'll talk about this, um, some specifics about this uh, truck, the actual interlock system, which is really important to understand how that works, uh, particular, particular braking systems and vehicle control systems in here. Again, you're looking at a truck with uh, a whole lot of technology in the cab. Uh, it's going to talk back to you and it's going to require a little bit of input from the driver to operate. We'll go through a complete cabin drill in, in, um, as well, um, both on the videos and in this documentation. Uh, the Class A foam system, any crew protection systems as well that's on board this appliance and hopefully people are out there now practicing all their uh, all their pre-summer training in, in terms of running their burnover drills. Uh, we've got checklists then that um, people can use to induct new people on the vehicle. It's got an operations checklist, a post-drive check, a pre-drive check, goes through all the pumping systems and has a checklist as well when we're doing supervising people to drive the vehicle and also conducting the inspection. So it's a really comprehensive package. Uh, that I think people will have um, great access to, both in written material but also online. Thanks, Stu. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of work gone into that, and uh, um, you know, I know the team have uh, pulled out all stops to make that happen. Uh, a real focus from uh, ODT uh, to make sure these trucks are going to be on the road for this summer. So uh, the first one's down. You've delivered the training to Berry Willick. 
uh, and uh, we're waiting for the next one to come online or come into the brigade that we can support them as we need to and support the district with the delivery of that training. The video package you've spoken about, the induction, who can do that? Um, can anybody do that, Stu? Yep, so at the moment anyone can access these videos. It's all available on members online. But I guess those, those who go on and um, want to be endorsed to use the vehicle, um, yep, they need to go through their, their brigade to do that process. Yep, and it's, uh, it's uh, normally the, um, uh, yeah, the captain will sign that off as, as a normal process within the brigade. So part of our role is to make sure that, you know, through the district that the captain's comfortable to sign off people on the truck as they would for any other vehicle. So, so uh, good work, Stu. Um, I uh, just... Uh, there's a couple of questions. Sorry, we might come back to those. Um, the uh, the link in the chat. So can um, yeah can people uh, um, just make sure you know use the the chat line online and um, we'll try and answer as many questions as we can through there. Um, what we will try and do is to pull those questions in when we've got topics that are running through. So um, we'll try and catch up on those. And I note uh, Sharon Linky's online, one of our MLDs uh, from Southwest Region, also answering some questions. So um, thank you, Sharon, for helping to uh, to keep up with that for us. Um, Stu, so really exciting times. Um, uh, how long did the training package take with the brigade or the induction? How did that go about? Yeah, so um, our... Our instructor went up and physically delivered this truck to the brigade. So spent a number of brigade, um, hours with um, each member, inducting them on the new appliance. That involved taking them right through the vehicle and also doing, a, uh, I guess, a drive with the, with the operators to make sure they were familiar with the vehicle. Uh, that went really well. I think um, we started that delivery uh, of the vehicle at the start of October. I think we finished that, this first round of training for Barry Willock in two weeks. And we're really looking forward to rolling out the next one, which we're going to Ballarat. Uh, I think in the next few weeks we'll be rolling out the second truck. So, yeah, exciting times. Excellent. So, uh, I'm sure we're looking forward to those uh, being online for this summer. Um, so, thank you. Uh, and uh, no doubt, Stu, if there's some other questions, we'll certainly uh, come back to you on those. Um, Molly, general firefighter. Yep. <laughs> um, how's it looking? We've said there's going to be a review. We've uh, uh, we've pulled the band-aid off. Yep. Um, what have we found? Awesome. So um, I guess we started the full review with some feedback that we had received um, last year. So when I first started at CFA, I got to jump straight into GFF, which I can tell you has been a wonderful way to learn things very, very quickly. Um, so once we realised kind of what we were dealing with and uh, where we kind of wanted to go with it, we realised that, you know, um, maybe it would be good to actually go out and speak to people and travel around, the, uh, travel around the state and get to see some really amazing things and some really cool brigades. So uh, armed with a wonderful playlist and uh, Kim, a fantastic person from the projects team uh, who picked out where we were going to go and selected all the ones we were going to, we headed out on the road um, and we got to see some incredible things. So we've attended uh, 11 different sessions across the state, across a number of districts. Um, and we've been able to speak to over 40 different trainers and so many more volunteers and new recruits to find out exactly what they were finding uh, with GFF was working, wasn't working and how we could do things differently. Um, and through this review as well, we've compiled a, uh, sorry, we've completed a uh, full review of all the current materials and this includes videos, online materials, everything. So um, I guess the current status of it is we are in the trenches with GFF right now um, and learning as much as we possibly can. That's, uh, that's really good, Molly. And I know, um, you know, the way that GFF is rolled out um, varies across the state. You know, it's certainly rolled out through districts and from our volunteer instructors rolling it out to our paid instructors, um, a, a huge range depending on the availability of people to roll it out, as well as the availability of the, uh, the brigades to conduct the training. Um, I know there's been some work done in District 16, so uh, some work on a three-day GFF course. Yeah. Um, fantastic work within the rules, within the fences of what we're allowed to do to maintain our RTO. Um, what do you know about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the absolutely awesome team in District 16, uh, they had the same idea that we had of how could we do GFF a little bit differently while still managing to stay within those confines because it is an accredited course. Um, and they figured out a way to do a three-day GFF. So it works fantastically for their group, for their area, uh, because that's what they were wanting. They were wanting something that was a little bit quicker, that was still managing to hit all the criteria and still making sure that the people who are finishing the course 
were just as comfortable and just as prepared as anyone else who would be doing the course. Um, so they've managed to do a three day spread out over the space of uh, roughly a week or so. Um, and it's currently done with, they've done a pilot and they're currently running a session at the moment. And uh, so far the feedback has been fantastic. So um, mad props through uh, to um, the District 16 crew for, for doing that. I can't wait to actually get to check it out myself. Yeah, awesome. Uh, and that's, you know, it's really what we're looking for is, is to make sure that the training that's delivered, the training that's designed is flexible enough that uh, districts can pick it up and, and work with their brigades, work with their groups to deliver the training that suits the needs, time, availability of volunteers. Yes, we need to meet the requirements, but uh, to have that flexibility in the package, I think is what we're really hearing through the GFF review. Absolutely. I think uh, what people want is, well, I guess what different districts want, what different groups want is to find out how they can make the program work for them. And so that's what we're looking into. How can we support everyone to make sure that we have a fantastic program? Because what we found out is there is no one size fits all with GFF. It's so varied because we are so far across the state that um, there's so many different ways to do it. And we found that, you know, we can't put it in a box. And this is why we went out traveling because, you know, uh, when we're looking at building this, I'm not a firefighter by any means. And I, um, I need to learn from the experts. And so we came out to speak to the experts. Um, so yeah, it's, we're, we're really hoping that we'll have something awesome, uh, awesome for you guys. So was there any surprises, anything that you didn't uh, the, yeah, you were, you were taken back by in, the, in the, uh, what you've learned. Yeah, absolutely. I guess taken back is, uh, it was more really awesome to see. So, uh, you know, from the way that they were doing really fun and engaging training in Patchy Wallach to uh, the group in Hildeen who were doing their assessment essentially through a simulation and creating this really fantastic scenario so that their uh, learners are really getting in there. So I guess it's been so awesome to see these really passionate trainers uh, that we have and the learners just jumping in on it and really, really buying in. And um, especially as well, uh, so many places we've gone to, we've not only seen the current new recruits, but also uh, operational volunteers who are coming in on you know the weekend to actually be there for the consolidation session or for an assessment session to share their own wisdom and to participate as well. So. That's just been such a wonderful, wonderful thing to, uh, to get to see and to get to celebrate. Yeah, excellent. Th thanks, Molly. Um, I know I think when GFF rolled out the first time, it was, you know, as around the start of COVID, yeah. you know, there were challenges in getting it out. Um, I know we've got a process, but do you want to share your thoughts just around, you know, some of the things that we need to get better mm -hmm. Um, as we roll out, you know, the next gen GFF, the, the revised package. Yeah, for sure. So with the improvement with GFF, uh, we understand from what we've been hearing from people is that there is such a strong want for um, really high levels of communication. So with the rollout that's going to happen with this one, uh, the aim is to have it happening uh, after fire season that's currently happening. So let's say March, April of 2024. Um, and with that, we're going to make sure that people are given advance notice that this is happening. So it's not just going to be, you know, dropped on you and said, hey, guess what? GFF's now happening in a different way. So we're going to make sure that everyone's involved, that everyone's across what's happening, that training takes place for those who need it and those who want it, um, to really make sure that everyone feels as comfortable delivering this as they can. Because this is the first course anyone who joins CFA will do. We want to set a really, really great, um, great standard from the, from the get-go. Yeah, beautiful. And, and the key is, not to make it any longer, is it? Yeah, I promise you we're not going to make GFF any longer. Um, that's, that was, I think, the number one thing that was said to us across the state. So um, GFF won't be getting any longer. Um, but we are going to make it something really, really wonderful and that we hope that everyone really can feel like that they've had a voice in and that they've been a part of. Yeah, lovely. Thanks, Molly. No um, uh, we've got Rob has asked a question around uh, why it takes so long then for uh, GFF trainees once they've completed to then be able to get on the truck. So uh, we certainly will have a bit of a think about that question and understand it. We might talk about it when uh, the panel changes just around that process of uh, completion of the course and then uh, that green light to go, that uh, issuing of statements of attainment. Um, so thank you, Molly. That's, that's really good work and we're looking forward to um, uh, to where that's taking us and I know uh, your passion is extremely obvious <laughs> uh, and I'm thankful for that. Thank you for having me. Um, we'll now cut to uh, a video on our IMT training so uh, uh, if we can move to that um, welcome to Simon Wilson who's just going to walk us through our IMT training. G'day I'm Simon Wilson Program Manager from Operational Doctrine and Training. 
CFA has been working with Emergency Management Victoria and our sector partners to increase our delivery of incident management training to our members this year and into the future. In 2023, we have had 79 members enrolled in IMT courses with the final courses to be delivered in the next few weeks. Most of these courses have been delivered working with EMV. Mapping and communications planning has been done in partnership with Forest Fire Management and one of the two operations courses was completed at the Rural Fire Service Training Centre in Dubbo. We are currently working on plans to deliver even more courses to our members in 2024, including delivery of these courses across the regions to provide more opportunities and to make courses more accessible closer to home. Nominations for these courses will be managed by your regional training team. If you wish to get started in IMT, you can always speak to your local regional operations coordinator. Introductory online courses are available for incident management through the EM Learning platform which is managed by Emergency Management Victoria. There is a starting course called Introduction to Emergency Management. And once you've completed that, you can have a look at the functional aims roles, including intelligence, logistics, planning, public information, and operations. Thank you to all the members who have taken the time to complete IMT courses in 2023. And best of luck as you step up into these roles in this current fire season. And the updated Introductions to AIMS course will be available on LMS in the next couple of weeks. If you're looking for further information, search Incident Management on Members Online and the training page will have links to the introduction courses as well as contacts for your local regional operations coordinators. Thank you. So thanks Simon. Um, as you can see, you know, we're working hard to try and move through the, uh, the IMT pathway uh, with the sector. So we're working alongside EMV and other partners to try and make as many courses available to our volunteers and to our staff um, to meet the need. And, and uh, there'll be more work to come. Uh, we'll look to roll out the uh, intro to AIMS and Nicole might talk about that later. The, uh, well, I might ask you now, Nicole, the, 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 uh, the rollout of the intro to AIMS really the gateway. Um, I know we've had that on a bit of a back burner for a while. How's that looking? Oh, it's nearly complete. We're just doing some final checks with the LMS team uh, this week. We've already had a draft review. We've gone back with some more enhancements. And so we're hopeful that we'll, we'll get that signed off on Thursday this week, which point we'll be able to do handovers with the regional teams and they'll be able to start scheduling. Beautiful. So that gateway's open and we'll start getting people through, which will be fantastic. Um, I know that uh, in my ear he's telling me that so I've got some people sitting up in Darwin that are extremely hungry and uh, have worked, uh, worked pretty hard for the last few days. So we might cut to... Uh, Di uh, Billingsley and Phil Graham, welcome uh, Phil and Di, up in NT, um, uh, time difference is a little bit there but um, yeah. how are you tracking? Oh, really, really well thanks Rowan, tired um, and it's very hot here in Darwin compared to, a wet hot here in Darwin compared to dry hot in Alice Springs but having a fantastic time and doing some really good work up here to support the NT guys in building their capacity. So do you want to just explain to us, Di, the, you know, you know, what sort of training you're delivering and, and, and what you've learnt from that training? Uh, basically, we're delivering the, the Northern Territory bushfires equivalent of GFF. Um, theirs is called FF1 and we've delivered to both rangers who work with Northern Territory Parks and last week to 14 new volunteers for Alice Springs Volunteer Fire Brigade. We're still trying to get our head around and understand fully the way it's structured up here because it's a little bit different. Um, there's fire, sorry, fire and rescue um, and there's in NT bushfires and they all sit under an emergency services umbrella and they all work together but there's also volunteers with fire and rescue and then there's um, another and I forget what it's called another group that are attached to fire and rescue that are kind of like casual employees if you like it's the, the distances up here are so vast and the agencies that work so closely up here um, to protect what's an enormous space, it's, the relationships are a bit difficult to get your head around. 
Oh, I could imagine the, the, the time and space between brigades and uh, the ability to deliver training. And just for the simple fact, you know, you've been delivering training in Alice Springs and you've got to hop in a plane to head to the other end of the state to deliver in Darwin uh, is, is a mass, massive effort. Um, how have you found the training? Mm. Yeah, the, the, I'll probably go to a bit of detail. It's, you know, it's, the um, Thanks. It's, it's, a, it's a very different package. Um, the content uh, of their package is, is in similar in many ways to our um, GFF package that we deliver here in Victoria. Um, but taking into account the, the differences of terrain, topography, uh, weather, um, the fuel is completely different uh, to what we experience in Victoria. But when it all boils down at the end, the fire behaviour that uh, these guys have to deal with is in some instances as bad or uh, unpredictable as uh, we've all experienced at home. So um, those differences can be um, can be met uh, quite quite easily uh, with a little bit of work and a little bit of knowledge that uh, they've helped us uh, gain since we're our arrival with inductions and uh, working with their equipment and their grass fire units. Um, tankers, uh, as we're used to having the bulk of our vehicles are, are tankers. Um, they have very few tankers and all they run is what they call grass fire units that in CFA we all know as ultralights um, and that's how they that's how they roll in the Northern Territory and uh, with some very different firefighting <laughs> techniques and tactics um, that I'm sure uh, uh, Jason would um, yeah be a little um, surprised to see any uh, CFA volunteers doing but um, nevertheless it's it works for them uh, it's the way they do things and um, it's look it's been a really interesting experience and I'd like to think we've uh, Di and I have learned uh, as much from from these guys up here as uh, we've delivered back to those guys so it's it's fantastic. Oh, absolutely, Phil and Di, it's a, it's a fantastic success story for um, the agencies to be able to work together in the way that we have. And I think, you know, the connection through AFAC and, you know, the AFAC peer review really set the agenda for us to work more closely with agencies. And, and you both are living that, you know, living the real outcome of that. Um, mm. I guess, you know... I think... The you go. Sorry, I was just going to say... Given the operational situation that they've had going on pretty much from the start of the year, um, the, all of their or the bulk of their instructors have been on the fire ground uh, for extended periods of time. Uh, for example, when we arrived last week, we came, went, checked in and went straight down to the Alice Springs headquarters and there were two or three instructors there that were working in the IMT that were able to give us uh, some time to start to, to answer any questions we had and look at the appliances and so on. They were supposed to be available again for us the next day, um, but overnight they had to travel uh, five hours up to Tennant Creek because Tennant Creek came under threat by the Barclay fire, which at that point had burnt about 2.8 million hectares and was that was the one that travelled the 40 k's overnight. So they had to smash those guys up there five hours on the road and then onto the fire line to to uh, work with, with those that were up there and the local pastoralists to protect Tennant Creek and the outlying uh, communities around that area. So it's it's um it's been a real privilege for us to be able to step into the breach and support the, them by providing training. Alice Springs Volunteer Brigade did a huge um, membership drive uh, earlier this year, and as as I said, they had some fifteen new members, but weren't able to get them trained because of the intense level of operational stuff that's been going on up here. Uh, similarly, up here in Darwin, they're in the same situation. Their operational staff are deployed all over the state. Um, and so they've got people lined up to do the training, but they're not actually able to deliver in the capacity that they need. The rangers um, that work under NT Parks 
also fall under the bush the NT bushfire umbrella. And so their training is a similar the similar package, but because of their prior experience, we're able to condense that down to into a, a very intense single day. But some of the guys that we signed off in Alice Springs are now on the fire ground, either in the Tanami, out at Hermansburg, up the road at Tennant Creek or wherever they're needed, really. Uh, so it's it's certainly we've been more than happy to, and and we were lucky that we were both able to jump you know jump in and help out at very very short notice because the time frames were very tight. Yeah, absolutely, Di. Look, um, <clears throat> the feedback I've had from NT while you've been up there, you know, is brilliant. They've ex they've really appreciated the work that you're doing. So that's that's fantastic news. Um, you know, I know you obviously you're working under uh, the RTO for Bushfires NT, so that was a bit of a, you know, hurdle that we needed to work through, uh, you know, not insurmountable. Uh, and I know we had to do a fair bit of work to, um, to make sure that the competency is carried across and, uh, you know, your qualifications. Yeah. But, you know, as, as instructors with a long history in CFA, that wasn't too hard a task. Um, you know, and Di, you know, I know you've got some qualifications in uh, Indigenous learning as well. Um, we'll go quickly mm -hmm. here, but does, has that come into play while you've been up there? But less than I expected it to, um, although I think with some of the Darwin crew, uh, we ha may have some, um, some participants that ha come from communities, uh, but certainly just engaging with a lot of the the learners from Alice Springs uh, they did a lot of work with community and um, just the that's for for that my personal um, learning understanding and discussing and talking further about the challenges and the joys that of remote communities face and the joys that people have find in being a part of those remote communities has has just added further to my understanding of their um of the the culture and the the strength and the dignity of the culture so so that's been a, a real benefit for me on a personal level yeah it's fantastic diet look and um, and i know we're going to spend some time with both of you when you get back after you've had a rest because um, we really want to hear about <laughs> the differences, the benefits. Uh, you know, I think this is the first time that I can recall we've had the opportunity to send instructors to deliver training in more of an urgent situation like this. And uh, um, fantastic we've been able to get people out on the fire ground and help them. Um, you know, it's a, it's a real magnifying yeah. effect you've done. So congratulations and thank you. Um, Di, I think uh, you're about to go to dinner. I hear uh, Crocodile's not on the menu tonight, is it? Not for this girl, no. Tomorrow, no. tomorrow night. <laughs> so the, the, uh, Josh, I must say, can I just say, Rowan, um, we met Colleen, who is the Jason's equivalent um, up here in the NT and had a couple of drinks with her the other night. Uh, Josh, who is the training coordinator, call warden, I, I don't even know what Josh's title is, but all of the people up here have been incredibly supportive incredibly helpful uh the we've had some great conversations with very fleeting ones with the operational instructors in between them dashing off to do stints in imt or on the fire ground and we've actually done our bit in helping out ferrying you know fleets of cars from headquarters down to depots to get road train back to south australia running out to get coffee dashing off to peak pick people up at the airport or drop people off at the airport. Um, so we've been able to do a, a little bit in terms of supporting the IMT work as well. Uh, but it's, 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 we've got some great, great stories. <laughs> <laughs> and we could, there are many things that they do up here in the NT that I, we both strongly believe we would benefit from, from looking at and utilising yes. in Victoria um because they don't have anywhere near as much cotton wool as we have and they do a damn fine job in very challenging circumstances they're fantastic up here yeah great um thanks di and 
um, yeah, you, you're booming with enthusiasm and you've been working really hard. So uh, the recipe sounds like it's right. So um, well done. We'll let you Excellent. go because uh, I do know you uh, You do need to move on to the next thing. And um, uh, again, thank you very much. You know, you've just really explained the whole essence of interstate deployments is about flexibility. It's about, you know, working out what the locals need and within the rules of play supporting that. That's what we'll be asking mm. the, yep. the people that go away to Queensland. You know, work within the teams, work safe. Mm. Um, you know, we're there to help. Uh, we're not there to change the world, but we're there to help. And that's exactly what you're yep. doing. So thank you and well done. Yeah. Great night. And good to see you, Molly, in face. <laughs> Uh, there's a fan club, Molly, that uh, you've certainly established. So, um, uh, well done. All right, thank you. We'll uh, we'll keep moving. Um, we we'll just talk quickly if we can around the Dubbo. So, following on from you know the the desire that we have to work with other agencies to understand what's happening in other parts of the world, um, we did uh, we sent 17 firefighters to Dubbo recently uh, to conduct uh, participate in a New South Wales Rural Fire Service course. Um, manage multi-sector and manage operations for a level two incident. So um, of the, uh, uh, occurred on the 11th of August, I think we've spoken about it through um, a series of uh, lead ups to both forums. Um, it was a six day period. I, I guess what the couple of learnings out of there is, is that we think we can deliver the two units similar to Queensland and, uh, sorry, similar to RFS. Uh, but we actually think we may be able to add a little bit more of the competencies within that time frame. So um, we'll certainly be having a look at that. Uh, it's um, uh, a really positive outcome. I know, again, you know, the two fire services working closely together is a real um, key for us, uh, really important and uh, um, where we need to be. And I know, you know, getting hold of packages from other agencies certainly is, is a key focus. I know we've got uh, packages that we've been working on that uh, other agencies are looking at, and we've picked up a few more that we're starting to do some work on. Um, Nicole, do you want to just um, explain a little bit of detail just around that process? Um, and uh, I will welcome Amanda as well. But um, uh, so Amanda Norris, who's a sorry, a manager of quality evaluation, um, and John Holway, manager of learning development from Southeast Region. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the panel and thank you for tonight. So, um, um, uh, Nicole, do you just want to talk about our relationship with the other fire services and what we're doing together? Yeah, certainly. So, uh, Amanda and I have been meeting with our counterparts in uh, each of the other states and territories to talk about what, what are the projects that they are developing at the moment, what are the projects that we're developing at the moment, and how we can work together to leverage our resources. And out of that, um, we've provided a number of packages uh, interstate and we've received a number of resources from Queensland and from New South Wales so far. Uh, and that's been really helpful to us, particularly where they've just recently redeveloped the packages for themselves. So we're getting really high quality resources from interstate which gives us a really good starting point that we can then uh, consult with our uh, subject matter experts and add a CFA flavour to it, uh, if you like, and make sure it's suitable for our environment. But it, again, it gives us that really good source material, uh, often with some interactivities, some really good ideas for drills, and as, as much as anything else, it's also a really good to see how other fire services approach particular units. Mm. Excellent. So, uh, you know, that relationship will keep working... Uh, um, working in partnership. We do have from time to time some uh, external agencies offering courses and Simon's asked a question about how CFA deals with external providers uh, that are offering uh, national units of competency. Um, how do we handle that between, uh, between our quality, our RTO requirements and also our training outcomes? Um, what does that look like, Nicole? Well, it's really important to remember that when we're preparing a training package for delivery to CFA members, it's not just about what the national unit of competency requires, it's really about CFA's operational requirements. So if you have a unit like uh, Prepare, Test and Maintain, when you read the unit, you only have to practice that skill on one piece of equipment. But we don't want our members to just be able to do that on one piece of equipment. There's a whole range of pieces of equipment that we need them to be familiar with and proficient at using. And so when we do our assessment, we assess them on all of those pieces of equipment. 
And that might may seem like it makes uh, what we deliver longer than uh, other providers, but it also means that our members are proficient in our environment with the skills we need them to have to be safe on the fire ground. Okay, so, so that makes a bit of sense. Um, but a, a national unit is a national unit. Um, how will we process that, process that, Amanda, when you know, we've got uh, members potentially coming to us with certificates they've attained from a fire service outside of CFA or from an uh, external provider, a company, a private enterprise. Yeah. Um, do we approach that differently or, or how have we decided to deal with that? Uh, so if we receive a, um, uh, a request for a credit transfer because someone has actually conducted or completed the training through another um, provider, we will definitely recognise the credit transfer. So we will process that through um, and provide the, the credit transfer in, um, from an RTO perspective. But there might be other additional um, uh, testing or skills that they need in order to be um, endorsed or, or ready to perform that role. So it will depend on the course and, and it, will, um, it will depend on what our requirements are. Uh, but what we do guarantee for people is that we will be providing the, um, we will recognise that certificate. It's just probably, it's, it's actually more about the operational skills and we, us making sure that the members actually have the skills that they need in order to perform the role. So it will, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's not an easy answer because it will depend on the, on the course that they're completing as to what, we, what action we take, but what we do, uh, commit to from an RTO perspective is we will uh, process the credit transfer but it might mean that this, the person's not recognised from a skills perspective until they've either done some additional training or gone through an assessment to test that skill. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, Amanda. So, you know, skills versus competencies, you know, it, it's a place that we do need to, uh, to work through. We need to uh, support our members um, and we need to, need to acknowledge the RTO process. Um, but we need to make sure our members are safe, surely. Thank you. So um, that's uh, hopefully addressed a couple of questions uh, that have been through the panel today. Um, courses that are rolling out. So courses in development. We, we often have questions around, you know, when a course is going to roll out, uh, where are we up to, um, what, is, what courses have we got in development at the moment, Nicole? What should we expect to see in the very near future? Sure, we have a, a lot of courses in development at the moment. Uh, we're concentrating a lot on our firefighter pathways, so uh, skills that, that those of you who are out there fighting fires need to have, so things like general firefighter and operate pumps, tree hazard assessor. We'll also be looking at a number of programs in what we would consider to be command and control roles. So a strike team leader and crew leader, for instance, but also items that are IMT prerequisites, so the AIMS Level 2, Fire Weather 1, Intermediate Bushfire Behaviour, uh, and some additional programs like Operational Doctrine in Practice, which are about building proficiency above competency. Um, we've put together a new process for the development of our programs so that we can start to add some enhancements uh, into them and to address uh, the AFAC peer review item about having the LMS as our source of truth. So moving forwards, all of our training resources will be located in the LMS for all of our members to access from there. And we're doing that with all of these new programs that, we're, uh, that are in development at the moment. And then we'll be looking back a little bit and rolling that out for everything else. As part of our process too, we're also um, developing RPL packages alongside the main delivery programs where it's appropriate to do so. Very good. So there's there's a lot of work in that space, and uh, I know you know the team like uh, Molly and the rest of the program designers uh, have been flat out the uh, really strong engagement with our SMEs, um, and obviously uh, you know the conversations that then occur once a course is developed with our joint training committee, um, Amanda. JTC. Yes. What, what, what's that acronym that we hear all the time? Uh, we certainly hear it in OD, ODT. There's another <laughs> one, Operational Doctrine and Training. Um, JTC, what's, uh, what's uh, that about? So JTC is the Joint Training Committee and it, it has members from uh, across training in CFA and uh, members from VFB, VFB, 
I can't even say it now, <laughs> BV. Uh, and it's really about putting, uh, providing an opportunity to engage with VFBV on training matters. Uh, and it can go from uh, course development design. Um, we consult with them on a regular basis around um, the development of training courses. Uh, and uh, it's a, a way of connecting around some of the delivery um, pieces as well. So we meet uh, quarterly. Uh, or, well, we, we meet four times a year. It's not necessarily exactly quarterly, but we meet four times a year and uh, uh, it's usually nearly a full day uh, on a weekend. Um, and then we connect with members. So Max and Mark through um, from VFBV, we meet with them on a monthly basis as well, just to connect in and make sure that there's no burning issues or topics that we can, that we need to address. Yeah, so a really important um, uh, meeting in a workshop that we have. Uh, we know, you know, our, our JTC members um, are instructors, a lot of them are mm. um, heavily involved in the delivery of training, uh, work at, uh, um, some of them even work in, in the field of training outside of, outside of CFA. Um, so a really good knowledge base. Uh, we work closely with them to review programs to, uh, to set our pathways and to um, really understand where we are in the future, uh, you know, our training enhancement. What we're trying to do to move into a into a new space within CFA is really for us to um, think about how training is delivered. So, what the end use end product is, if you want to talk in that sort of form, um, you know, what is training like? How does it uh, how is it benefit? How is it received from the volunteer? And uh, so, if we put the volunteers at the centre of what we do, the the students, the um, the firefighters in training, um, I think we get a better outcome. That's the focus that we're working to, uh, you know, making sure that we don't make courses too long, that we achieve what we have to achieve to work safely, but um, do it in a flexible way that can be delivered through a multiple range of um, uh, sources and a, a, a multiple ways of um, training delivery uh, to get to the right outcome. So I think there's, um, uh, there's a fair bit happening in a JT space JTC space. Um, unfortunately, the workload for them is quite significant. I do want to acknowledge um, the part that they play to, uh, or the members in JTC play to support the delivery of training into the field. Um, talking about training into the field, um, John, welcome. Thanks, Ron. Um, so John's one of our MLD. So uh, from a pure training sense, uh, as a DCO in charge of ODT, I'm responsible for the development delivery uh, sorry, development design and governance around training. We do some delivery from a state level, you know, things like first aid courses, um, some of our specialist rescue courses and similar. Um, but the majority of training is delivered through the region and you're one of five MLDs. Um, what, what does that entail for you? How do, how do you work out what training to deliver from a regional point of view, John? Um, sure, thanks, Ron. Oh, look, we... Um I suppose as a starting point, we use uh, BCPA, um, the, the, the Baseline Capability uh, Profiling Application, which is a pretty universal tool in uh, CFA these days, and it contains a lot of data, and particularly uh, it's good for uh, understanding the skill profiles across our brigades. And once you know the skill profile and brigade, uh, you can work out what the gaps are. And the gaps are calculated by using the BOSP data. So when uh, the district ACFOs and their, um, their catchment teams um, update their BOSP targets. That feeds into BCPA and we can look, and look, look into the tool and see that a particular brigade or a group has got a gap in a particular uh, competency. Um, and that basically drives our, our training planning process, if you like. So we just build that up across all of the different competencies, depending on the, the risk profile of the brigade. Um, and we create a, a basic demand program, if you like, and then we work with ACFOs uh, to get some prioritisation. We can't always close all gaps uh, in any given year. So we work with the ACFOs and their, and their uh, teams uh, to agree on some priorities for delivery. Uh, and then we go through the exercise of um, making sure that our instructors and our TAs, such as Phil and Di, who we spoke to earlier, um, are allocated as effectively and efficiently as possible to the delivery of those of those courses. Some courses we have to uh, push back to a, to the following year um, because perhaps an ACFO has requested a, 
uh, a higher priority on some particular area, uh, particularly something at the moment, respond to urban fires is, 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 a, is a pretty high priority right across the region. Uh, so we've probably dropped a few other courses off um, so that we can really make sure we cover off on uh, or give every, every one of our 20 groups in South East region uh, the capacity to um, access that course. Thanks, John. So, so one of the questions that came through earlier uh, this week was a question around delivering training courses. You know, the, the question alludes to, you know, why are we focusing on just delivering training courses on weekends? Um, you know, I know uh, we've run 27, we, collectively, um, across the state, 27 responder urban courses have been run so far since July, which is a fantastic effort. Yep. I think we've got around 130 people now accredited in responder urban, and we heard um, Aaron talk earlier tonight about you know making it fit within the training campus. Um, how do you make it fit? How do you choose whether it's a weekend course or a weekday course, or or when's the best time to run the programs? Sure. Look, we would normally reach that sort of conclusion. Um, working with the groups themselves. So each um, each district will normally have a group training committee or it's a, normally a subcommittee of the DPC. We work with uh, those group those group subcommittees um, to make sure that when we do set up the, the course that's been agreed to by the ACFO, that we can actually deliver it uh, at a location and in a time or a format uh, that works for the volunteers that we're actually targeting in that group. And if that means uh, it's a Monday to Friday course, um, then we're happy to run a Monday to Friday course, or in this case, uh, with Respond to Urban, we're basically running it two weeks straight. So, um, so we're quite comfortable with the idea of running weekday courses. Um, and in fact, provided we can cover the material, we're happy to entertain any, any format that, that people feel they works for them. Work. Yeah. And I think we've seen, certainly in South East region, uh, we've seen the success of uh, GFF running out, you know, I think, you know, from, from a southeast point of view, a lot of your GFFs run through the brigade and group structure. Yep. Um, and my observations of that, Molly, is that where GFFs running out, for an example, at a local level to meet the local needs of the local members, we get the best outcome and the most flexible Absolutely. way of delivering training. So uh, I, I guess that's a really strong message for the question, but a good example of making the training um, uh, providing the training that supports the volunteers' availability and needs, so um, really important. And we just saw on the screen a minute ago just the, uh, some of the data from the courses, competencies that have been delivered since January. So, um, you know, some really impressive numbers there. Always room for improvement and, uh, you know, that's probably the thing that I hassle uh, the teams about is how can we pump more training out, how can we get it more available and um, that's a real focal point for all of us. Pathways in training, you know, how a member knows what's the next course to do, how important is that? Is that, is that uh, Yeah, look, it is important and it's something that um, I know the AFAC peer review um, uh, brought that up and I know that Nicole and Amanda have been working on uh, pathways um, and I think the JTC's uh, had some involvement in de 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 the development of pathways as well. It is important. Um, it's probably not the be all and end all and a lot of, uh, a lot of volunteers are, are quite happy to work through a pathway based on their brigade profile, uh, but it does help, I think, and even from a from a training planning point of view, it helps to know what comes next, um, and perhaps we can sort of forecast a bit of demand by knowing what comes next and, and how many people are likely to be asking for certain types of courses. But yeah, uh, yeah it'll, it'll be good to see them when they're actually yeah. out there and agreed to. Abs absolutely. John, I think uh, we've all been waiting for that and we've certainly, um, the AFAC peer review, it was a uh, it was a real learning out of it. The project control board and the work groups around it were really strong to make sure that we, we completed that work and we will. Um, we have progressed it. Uh, Nicole, where is the, um, the pathway? Uh, so the pathway currently, it's gone through a lot of, we've had a lot of consultation in order to put it together to make sure that what we've got in the pathway accurately represents where we want to be. It's been reviewed by uh, the DCOs and we're now taking it to the JTC for their consultation. Um, we need to get feedback from all parties to make sure that we've got uh, the right courses in the right places being the prerequisites for the, yeah, for the roles. Yeah, so um, there's a lot of work being done on that to pull it together. I think we've really focused on the operational um, roles, the, the firefighter roles all the way through. Uh, there's some work in that we're still doing around the IMT roles in consultation and discussion with EMV and our sector 
um, partners. Uh, we've obviously done a little bit of work and we'll talk to JTC when we get to that next step around our community safety, community engagement roles. I think there's some work done on the pathways for mm -hmm. that. Uh, we've still got a bit to do on our operational support roles and you know there's a range of that, but we want to give the better um, clarity around those pathways for ops support. So some really good work occurring in that space in line with the AFAC peer review. Um, uh, and we'll uh, uh, continue to work through it. The AFEC peer review, if I can just quickly, I am getting the wind up from, uh, uh, from the floor manager, as uh, Jason calls him, so uh, I will need to keep going. But the AFEC peer review is still progressing. Uh, we've got some exciting announcements uh, shortly that we're working on. Obviously, there's some areas around recognition to volunteer instructors, uh, you know, support, um, uh, we've picked up on a few things tonight, talking about um, pathways, talking about uh, LMS, talking about how we support our um, instructors better. So all of that stuff that we're still working on, we're continuing to monitor it. We'll talk to the JTC about that in the next meeting uh, in a bit of detail. So really um, good things occurring in training and uh, I know how hard people are working in learning and development in the field, our instructors, both paid and volunteer and um, ODT, so um, real hats off to everyone to make this work for our volunteers. The, um, well, there's been a number of questions come through tonight which we haven't been able to get to in the chat. Uh, you know, it's been a little bit different sitting on this side of the desk. Normally we're sitting behind the desk and uh, typing away the answers to the questions and I have to say uh, I'm probably only good doing a couple of things at once and uh, trying to keep up with the questions has been really difficult. So um, we will get back to people where we can, when we can identify names. What I'd encourage people to do is if the question wasn't answered tonight, to email the team on um, training at cfa.vic.gov.au. So that goes directly to our team um, and we will respond to uh, any questions that come through on that. The last thing, if I can just talk about it, um, uh, just a bit of a plug. So uh, for me, you know, the future for CFA is in our in our younger members. Uh, you know, that's where the uh, the future will come from. There's an opportunity for uh, some of our younger members to join the uh, youth, sorry, the Young Adults Advisory Committee. So uh, we're seeking two representatives aged between 18 and 30 years from each district um, uh, to present ideas to form the views of the adults, uh, sorry, the young adults are involved in CFA. So um, if people can keep their eye out, those between 18 and 30 who would like to be involved in an adult, um, young adults advisory committee, um, keep their eye out online. Uh, we'll no doubt have further information coming out, but I'd encourage people to, to um, work through that and, and uh, see what's coming around the corner because uh, if we talk about, and we haven't tonight, we haven't even gone into virtual reality, um, you know, it's discussions we've been having in our team about you know, how do we continue to roll out VR um, and make it uh, you know, linked to our training, not just skills maintenance, but be able to use it for skills acquisition, potentially even assessments you know, down the track. So uh, really exciting space and I reckon the young people in our organisation will lap it up. Um, some of the older ones like me will work pretty hard to keep up to speed with it, but um, that's probably which where we're at. Um, the, uh, the footage from tonight's uh, session will be online, so um, for people who have missed out or can follow up, um, this will be dropped online uh, through the YouTube or members online. People will be able to share that with their brigades and uh, if they uh, want to catch up on it, share this message around, uh, that would be really good. I would ask people if they're also interested in training to look at the brigades online. We've done some work to upgrade our brigades online site to hopefully make it more user friendly, um, more intuitive, a little bit easier to find things and certainly uh, to find more information. So I encourage people to go online and have a look at that as well. I think that's pretty much it for the night. I'll, uh, what I will do is wind up. I want to thank everyone who's been involved and come online and asked a series of questions. Uh, Chief, I know you've even asked a few questions in there as well, which is uh, really pleasing to see that uh, you're, uh, you're still going okay. Um, to the panel, thank you. Uh, it's really good to have the, um, a part of the team here tonight. We're a big team in ODT, 
uh, and we're representatives of that bigger team. And behind the, uh, the crew here, we've also got some of our other team members who are also across the discussions that we've been having. So again, thank you to everyone. Please, uh, for those driving, drive safe. For those uh, um, finishing up for the night, please have an enjoyable night. I look forward to uh, seeing how our crews go in Northern Ter sorry, in Queensland over the next few weeks. Uh, it's going to be a busy time for CFA. Look after each other, stay safe and take care.